I did not recognize this morning.
Gas Conservation Commission rulemaking on the recommendation 17 and 20 from the governor's oil and gas task force. Monday, December 7th. There's something famous about that day. What? My mother's birthday. That's right, your mother's birthday. I remember. Okay, um, Ms. Murphy, do we have any commissioners present? I suspect we do, Chairman. Um, but I'll call roll nonetheless. Commissioner Arnold? Here. Commissioner Benton? Here. Commissioner Craig? Here. Chairman Compton? Here. Commissioner Hawkins? Here. Commissioner Bolton? Here. Commissioner King? Here. Commissioner Spartan? Commissioner Wilk? Here. We are good to go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, probably wouldn't hurt if you, you or the director gave us just a tiny bit of direction on uh, where we are in the process and what we're going to do this morning and today. I'd be happy to. Sorry for the interference. Um, so we are at Ward and the Bill Point. Um, there was a third party hearing order that was sent out by the hearing officer and um, that identified for all the parties that were going topic by topic. The four remaining topics are two repeats and mitigation measures, proximate local governments, effective date, and then followed by remaining issues at which point parties also have the opportunity to make a closing statement. Um, today, I have a list from the last hearing that identifies what parties wanted to present by topic, but of course, if parties want to change their mind, they need to let me know. Um, and so at this point, I believe we'll be heading into the BMPs and mitigation measures discussion. Staff will lead it off. It will be followed by um, the citizen group, act in, and I believe Sierra Club is reserving its time. If that's not true, please let me know. Um, and then the, f and then Miss Catherine Hall. So. Okay, BMPs and mitigation measures. It does say including duration limits, but maybe not. So I guess uh, staff will have the first cut of this. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, my name is Matt Lepore. I'm the director of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. I want to take one second to uh, thank the University of Colorado Denver School of Public Policy for hosting us this morning. Appreciate that. Um, and with that, I will uh, begin the staff presentation on our proposed rule 604C4 uh, which was a large urban mitigation area facility best management practices. Uh, on the screen, I have a slide of recommendation 17's language, um, which says that the third part of recommendation 17 was to address the authority of and procedures to be used by the director to regulate a location when permitting large scale oil and gas facilities for the purpose of reducing impacts and conflicts with communities. This shall include siting tools to locate facilities away from residential areas when feasible. Where siting solutions are not possible, the director would require mitigations to limit the intensity and scale of the operations, as well as other mitigations to lessen the impacts on neighboring communities. Um, as you all are aware, in the first draft of staff rules, there was a three-part 
uh, BMP process. Um, that required best, man best management practices, some required mitigation measures, and then some site-specific mitigation measures. One of the proposed required mitigation measures was a duration limit. Uh, the concept uh, from staff's point of view was uh, a potential limit on the duration of 24-7 operations, that is primarily drilling and completion. Our concept was that we would evaluate an operator's proposed operations once we understood the exact scope of that operation, the magnitude of that operation, and the best management practices that they had in mind to use. Having evaluated that, we could then assess how many wells they intended to drill, look at what we understand to be average drilling times in the basin for wells of different lengths uh, and so forth. Evaluate that and then in collaboration with the operator and the local government, talk about a reasonable time for that operation, for those 24 seven operations to be completed. From that point of view, it was very much a, a site specific proposal. For me, it was kind of the backstop, kind of the last line of defense to do what recommendation 17 here suggests, that is to limit the intensity and scale of the operations. Uh, as you all know, from staff's point of view, we felt that given the scope of the task force recommendation, changing the definition of an urban mitigation area was problematic for this rulemaking because the task force very directly said using the existing urban mitigation area definition. But were we to change that, we could tweak some of the scale and intensity of operations. Think particularly perhaps about distance to schools, which is part of the urban mitigation area facility definition. Um, we also felt it was not appropriate in this rulemaking to directly address setbacks. That was discussed during the task force rulemaking and we don't have a recommendation that says we should reevaluate the setbacks that you adopted in 2013. So in certain ways, we felt a bit limited in the ability to address what the third part of 17 is. That's quite bluntly and honestly for me where the duration idea came from. Again, a backstop. Industry doesn't like the idea. Um, industry has questioned whether this commission under the Conservation Act actually has authority to put that kind of a limit in place and beyond the legal authority challenge questions. They have, I think, put together um, good information, helpful information about what the economic impacts of that might be, what the unintended consequences might be, um, how that might affect neighborhoods and so forth, how it could actually extend drilling over a longer period of time, which are things we weren't particularly interested in doing. So as you know as well, um, by virtue of a memorandum from Assistant Attorney General Matter and an email from myself, we pulled dur duration limits out of the rule with the understanding that we do have authority to impose a limit like that on a site-specific case-by-case basis under existing Rule 305E. And that will be our plan on a go-forward basis. Um, we will look hard at these sites. We will look hard at the mitigation measures that an operator indicates to us they will do. We will look hard uh, at the manner in which they intend to do their fracture operations as an example. Um, in the conversations in stakeholder meetings and inside conversations, we talked about the technology that is out there today that can really bring down 
the impact to a neighborhood. Remote fracking is one of those opportunities so that you take the truck traffic out of the neighborhood. If you can pipe the water in and pipe the water out. We all have had the opportunity and some of you joined us at a frack site that was powered by turbine, gas fired turbines on site. Much quieter operation. So we would, again, evaluate those kinds of things. Keep in mind here, I, I, I have to say this, um, we are talking about a rule that governs large sites in residential neighborhoods. That's what we're talking about. There's no limit, we've put no limit on the size of the site, no limit on the number of wells or tanks. That's not part of this rule. So in that context, I think we need a backstop. We need to understand how these sites are gonna be built and operated and how the impacts are going to be managed. And if it doesn't get where we think it needs to be, I think we're having a conversation about duration limits under 305E. Um, we have a siting tool rule now, 604C2EI, that requires multi-well production facilities to be located as far away as possible. Uh, we have drastically increased our scrutiny and application of that rule to multi-well sites. That rule applies to these sites and we will continue to use that rule. Uh, one of the stakeholders, uh, it's, a, it's a group of the citizens put together and put forward, I think, a, an interesting proposal on formalizing that process a little bit with a set of criteria. Uh, I commend that to you for your close review. Um, it has things in it like evaluating the technical and economic feasibility, evaluating the environmental and topographic considerations, uh, considerations of the surface owner and adjacent landowners and so forth. So take a look at that. Um, might be some, something we could do policy-wise, guidance-wise. It could also be part of the rule uh, so that everybody knows what the evaluation is based on. Um, one of the first things we put into our draft rule was that these sites, these large urban mitigation area facilities should be built and operated to the highest possible standards. Um, we had state of the art in the draft rule. Um, there was a concern that that wasn't a well-defined term. So I think we've just changed it to um, best management practices. But we now have uh, two sets of Sorry, I try to get to the right slide here. Large human facilities shall be built and operated using the best available technology to avoid or minimize adverse impacts to adjoining land uses. To achieve this objective, the director will require best management practices and may also impose site-specific conditions of approval related to operational and technical aspects of the large UMA facility. Um, and now here's the revised list of required best management practices. We want to incorporate all of the 604C3 best management practices, and we will not approve a permit for a large UMA facility until we are satisfied that the following list of things have been addressed appropriately for a given site and using the best available technology. And we just have a list of five or six here um, I'm not going to read them all, but these were the things that we would expect at every one of these facilities. An operator must explain to us and to the local government and to the citizens how they are going to address these issues, each and every one. There's the uh, second part of the list.
And then in addition to that, we have the authority to impose the site-specific mitigation measures. And again, we just made a list of the things. I view this as really putting the operators on notice, right? These are the things that come up. We know these things are gonna come up. We want you to think about these things. We want you to address these things. Um, and if you don't, we will in the permit. Uh, those include noise, ground and surface water protection, visual impacts associated with placement of wells or production equipment, and remote stimulation operations. We do think it's important to acknowledge uh, the process that we're trying to put in place here of collaboration with and hopefully agreement with, let me emphasize again, the concept of 17 was to reach agreement with the local government about these so locations. Uh, and, and with that consultation and hopefully an agreement, uh, we want to acknowledge that we would give substantial deference to mitigation measures or best management practices agreed to by the operator and local government with land use authority. So if, you know, it, in some ways, if it works for the local government, it ought to work for us. Uh, I, I won't say that in absolute terms, but that should be a big step forward if it's good enough for the local government with jurisdiction um, we will give substantial deference to those so i'm going to stop there and would be happy to answer questions questions for the director Good morning director um i just had a question about the limitations, I guess, on, should there be, I guess, this question, should there be a limit for the size of facility that we allow in an urban mitigation area? And I know that's not directed, you know, it by the current rule, and it's a little bit fuzzy uh, from the task force, but there are concerns about mitigations and limitations and siting facilities as far away as possible from neighborhoods. So should we be considering something like that? Mr. Commissioner, I, I think you should consider that. I think you should consider every way in which it's appropriate for this commission to manage and set expectations for operators to manage and operate these sites. Uh, we've talked about this before. These are right now 1% of sites. We know that number is going to go up, but it's not going to be the majority of sites. Uh, these are the sites that are the most contentious always. These are the sites that draw the greatest attention um, from the people of the state of Colorado. Um, we have to balance this, of course, and this is, this is the, the important part and the difficult part. We have to balance the mineral owner's rights with everybody else's rights. We, we don't want to preclude recovery of the resource. We don't want to fragment all of these sites unnecessarily. I thought about this word a lot over the last several weeks. Tension. There's a lot of tensions that, that this agency has to kind of rec try to reconcile. Surface owner, mineral owner, local government, state government. Small sites that don't draw a lot of attention, but that we would have many, many of those versus these consolidated facilities that really do reduce the overall surface impacts, environmental impacts potentially. But if you're a neighbor to one of those, different situation. I, since we've really started talking about this, even before the task force was convened, um, internally we put together a list of sort of urban best management practices. The thing that, that appeared on that list more often than anything else, I believe, uh, were the tanks and the consideration of having tankless facilities. 
when I go out and look at sites, uh, as I did recently in, in Adams County in the Wadley Farms neighborhood or in Weld County, uh, the Rasmussen Well, you have 35 or 40 acres there. I, I know the citizens don't want to hear this, but 10 or 12 wells on that site, once they're in, that's not, to, in my mind, a continuing problem, impact. It's not zero. But you put 36 tanks in that same property, that changes things. So that's, you know, I'm sure I've said far too much, but I'll stop. Thank you. Additional questions? Uh, Commissioner King. Ms. Chairman, first, first a, a, a brief comment and, the, and then a question. Um, having come out of a couple days of hearing and spent a couple weeks thinking about this, wrestling through this, uh, Director Laporte, they've hit on it. We, we are wrestling with what I began to refer to as a Rubik's Cube with multiple areas of tension. We have tension between the state authority and local authority. We have tension between the mineral interests and the surface estate. We have tension between ag interests and urban, where those two uh, activities collide. And this Rubik's Cube is kind of locked up on us in the context of the abstraction of how we wrestle through these things. What, what we have done and will continue to do and where the sweet spot is, is as it is applied, we, we can work through these things. Where, where we get confounded is when we try and have an abstract discussion about where there's, in the general sense, a conflict, who wins? Well, we can't answer that. Um, but I think when we take a, a site-specific proposal, and then begin to work through the issues with the impacted interests in a concrete manner rather than the, in the abstract, we have a history of, of being able to do this much more effectively. And I think that's one of the reasons that um, I'm, I'm pleased to see where we are with the duration issue. I think uh, uh, Assistant Attorney General, General uh, Matter's opinion uh, will be very helpful. We can avoid that conceptual conflict right now and still have those tools available to us on a site by a site specific basis. So, so that, that's my comment. My question uh, is for the director, um, the recommendation that led to this, to 604C, what did it envision would be the tools or the, or the, or the product for those agreements that are envisioned in 604C? Commissioner King, so tools for uh, the, sort of the site location, those those kinds of tools. Oh, um, well, I think the the recommendation. So I think, well, maybe I'm confused, but I think recommendation 20 talks more about the agreements, um, and we'll get to recommendation 20 next. But fundamentally, as far as I'm concerned, it can be just about any agreement that is reached between the local government and the operator. And as long as they both agree that they have an agreement, it's okay with us. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm off in thinking land. Commissioner Craig. I'm trying to go ahead and, and, and get this straight in my head, okay? What you're proposing here are, I think someone who provided testimony last time talked about a sliding scale. They talked about, you know, the more best management practices that you have in place, possibly the more wells that you could have. In other words, the more best management practices you have in place, the less risk you're going to have to the surrounding community. Is that the kind of thing that you see here? Is that what you're thinking about? Yes, Commissioner, in, in broad brush strokes, yes. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't tie it, I wouldn't make the tie to wells. I think the right metric for wells is what it takes to get the resource out. Um, but I think with that metric, 
then it then the focus turns to how do you mitigate the impacts and again sorry i can't get away from it we're talking about facilities that are between 500 and a thousand feet from 22 or 11 homes that's what we're talking about so you got a job to do to mitigate those impacts and operators are getting better at it and we'll continue to get better at and it and they now. probably will continue to get better at it but they need to demonstrate to us that they are committed fully to the best that they can be and and knowing what they have available to them and what they intend to do that's that's what we're looking at and, that, and i think that this set gets us there could i I'd also like to go ahead and say that i have a caveat to all of this it admittedly this is not like texas where you get into root or wyoming um where you have h2s I think all bets are off the table the moment you've got H2S, particularly if you get to 0.05 PSIA. Um, it, to date, has not been a problem in Colorado, but whenever you're in urban facilities, as far as I'm concerned, it's a different ball game if we ever get to that. So it's not specifically stated here. I just want to go on the record as saying that. Thank you. Additional questions? Commissioner Allward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want some reassurance from you. When you said with um, these mitigation measures, you kind of put it as if it's okay with the local government, it's okay with us. I'm assuming as long as it meets some minimal standards, it's protective of human health, safety, welfare, and all that. Yes, absolutely, Mr. Commissioner. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. One more question. Commissioner Craig? Who keeps that list of best management practices? For example, it may not just be tanks. It may not just be well control. It may be the frequency of the fire department practicing if there is an event. Where is that list and who's keeping track of it? Thank you, Mr. Madam Commissioner. Um, I don't, I don't I could maybe ask Greg Dronlo to help me here. I, I don't know that we have a list uh, that we you know, pull down and look at the, the fire example is a good one, and it's been it's been raised here with the Wadley Farms uh, situation because allegedly there's no fire hydrants and there's no fire department within a certain distance and so forth. And I, I say allegedly, just I mean I take them at their word. But um, so a different solution needs to be reached there than it than it does if it so happened that your large urban mitigation area facility was around the corner from engine company number three. Um, so it does feel to us that it's appropriate to do it on, you know, sort of that site specific basis. Uh, so what training and experience does a local government have in this is a fair question on, on uh, the local fire department. Do they have foam available to them, foam trailers available to them? Well, if the answer to that is no, it seems to me the operator needs to see that 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 would be available at all times. So I think generally speaking, I would say between our engineering group, our environmental group, um, we have a pretty good sense, the field inspection group, we have a pretty good sense of, of the technologies that are available. Um, and that, and then from that point, it's, it's sort of, you know, the collaboration and the discussion with local government and the operator. Are there questions? Do you see that Commissioner Spielman is seated over here? He may have been here for an hour. I don't know. But. Well, I did have the opportunity to note that he came in as Commissioner Craig was asking the first question, which is about 931. A director, it, it, let me seek some clarification just so I understand. Uh, within the limitations that Commissioner Allward mentioned, you, you and your staff are pretty much okay with any agreement that the local government reaches with the uh, industry proposing the, the siting of this large facility? With the limitations that Commissioner Allward and I discussed, yes. And if, if I may, I, I realize that I have recommendation 17 right here with me. So returning to Commissioner King's question, the uh, recommendation itself says these agreements, 
between the operator and local government can be documented in a memorandum of understanding, best management practices on a COGCC permit, a comprehensive drilling plan, unconventional resource units, a local government land use permit, or any other mechanism in which agreement is established. So I think the instrument is less important to us than the existence and the shared understanding that an agreement is there. And, you know, I mean, I can think of, well, let's, maybe let's go back to the tanks. I mean, if, if the local government thought it was just fine for there to be 40 tanks without any additional mitigation, we would want to have a long conversation about how those tanks were going to be bermed and secondary containment and lining and unloading and so forth. Good, good, thank you. That's what I was getting at. You, you do have some potential oversight on those agreements. On those technical issues, absolutely. Okay, additional questions? Thank you very much, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, citizen groups. While they're coming up, I, I was reminded that I should silence my phone so I don't interrupt anyone in their testimony. And, I don't get fined a thousand dollars by my colleagues, so you may want to take heed of that as well. Proceed when ready. Thank you again for this opportunity. <clears throat> I'm Chandra Berry from Windsor Neighbors for Responsible Drilling. Siting tools and alternative location analysis are critical in an urban setting. I recognize that situations may exist where no alternative site for a multi-well pad exists. And the first chosen site may be the only site available to an oil company. My experience over the past year has taught me that when siting multi-well pads, a comprehensive site analysis and an alternative location analysis is imperative if the industry insists on operating in the urban setting. The 28-well Great Western PACE proposal in Windsor is a perfect example of a poorly chosen pad site. This site led to much discussion and contention across the state. Unfortunately, in my community, it's not the only example. At the same time, Great Western submitted their permits for a 28 well pad site in a UMA less than half a mile to the north. Another company had staked 12 wells inside my Highland Farms neighborhood. The subdivision consists of split estates and intact estates. The prevailing document is, in this case, is the Declaration of Covenants, Constrict, Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions. This declaration provides surface protection to all residents in Highland Farms. The declaration was established prior to any separation of the intact estate. Therefore, oil and gas activity in Highland Farms would be a violation of the declaration. After careful research prior to the purchase of our home, it was these documents that convinced us that it was safe to purchase our home. The 12 wells were also staked in an open space easement, 
which grants to all residents of Highland Farms the non-exclusive and perpetual open space easements over, across, and upon the property. Any development activities on any portion of open space easements violates the provisions of the prevailing documents. Therefore, give you no legal authority to oil and gas development. In addition, this company erroneously leased minerals that the surface owner didn't even own, leaving a cloud on the title of the actual mineral owner. So why is all of this important? It's important because it illustrates that there were a multitude of errors and oversights in their planning process. There was no location analysis or due diligence performed at this site. There should be structured and clear guidelines in place to limit confusion when siting an oil and gas facility. It is absurd to expect citizens of this state to police the oil and gas industry. The citizens of Colorado deserve better neighbors. Not more than half a mile away, another company, now bankrupt, leaves behind a host of heirs. The previous administration in 2010 permitted a company to drill near a neighborhood. It was their first attempt at drilling near homes as stated by the COO August 2011 in the Greeley Tribune. He said, yes, it's his first time his company has drilled near a subdivision. Unfortunately, the two-way permit that was approved in 2010 was without a sensitive area determination performed. This oversight proved to be the demise of the entire operation as a cease and desist was ordered April in 2012 for numerous environmental and public health violations. Today, this administration is charged with reclaiming the two sites, plugging, plugging and abandoning one of the wells. The company, they leave behind a $63,000 bond to contribute to this reclamation. How did this one operation get so far out of control? It seems to me the best layer of protection from the start would have been a thorough, meaningful, and public location analysis. Just like some locations may have only one available site for a pad, this is an example where there may not have been any suitable location for a pad. Mm -hmm. In the urban setting, we hear a lot that the industry wants to be a good neighbor. Considering the three locations I just mentioned, it does not appear in my community that the industry is trying very hard to be a good neighbor. Unfortunately, Three weeks ago, the industry once again couldn't help themselves. On a Saturday morning, I was alerted by neighbors that it appeared two people had walked in on our private property. My husband met them at their vehicle. They were surveyors, surveying corner sections for an oil company. They told my husband, yes, we, we have the right to trespass, but we're finished and we're leaving. Monday morning, I called the oil company and the surveyor. Both conversations started the same way. Yes, they were surveying quarter corner sections, but both of the men really wanted me to understand that they had a right to trespass. Both conversations ended the same way. No. In fact, you do not have the right to trespass. In Colorado, we have a state statute, 18-4-515, that states, surveyors have the right to enter property, private property, once they have fulfilled nine line items of notification. Neither the oil company or the surveyor even attempted to fulfill a single line item of notification that Saturday morning. This is not being a good neighbor. I will say, they did issue me a letter of written apology. I recognize that you do not have authority over surveyors, but you do have authority over the oil and gas industry. And I share this example because it illustrates perfectly 
that while the industry would like for the citizens to think that their rights supersede our rights, in fact, the oil and gas industry's rights do not supersede my rights. All of these errors that I have highlighted here are sloppy and, and the industry should be embarrassed. This industry needs your help and the citizens, we need your help. If the industry so badly wants to be a good neighbor, let's set the stage for that to happen. I recommend you establish clearly defined siting rules, not just siting tools. Requiring alternative location analysis before any surface use agreement is signed in an exception zone or buffer zone. The internal policies the COGCC is using for permitting should be incorporated into the rules. Policies and administrations can all change. However, the obvious and increasing need for comprehensive location analysis in the urban setting will never change. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a moment in case there's a question for Ms. Berry. Commissioner Benton. Thank you, those are some great examples. Very much appreciate that. I was curious about, you mentioned early on about, I believe it was Highland Farms, there was a document in place, and I tried to write fast, but I didn't get it all written down. <laughs> uh, more or less, it, it fairly restricted oil and gas development uh, in, a, in the area, I think, uh, or was it just restricted surface access? And I'm, and I'm curious, sort of the lead is, how did that do particular document uh, address uh, the mineral rights in there? and, and Assuming that, and you said earlier that the title was clouded on some of that, it's a, sort of assuming that it isn't. How did that document sort of tie back to any minerals that had been leased uh, within two, Island Farms? Two separate issues. The cloud on the title of the actual mineral owner was um, because the oil company misleased, they leased more minerals than the actual owner was owned. So, um, that was the cloud on the title of the actual mineral owner. So they needed to um, record publicly that that lease was inaccurate. Um, the documents, the covenants, conditions, and restrictions, those are documents that we all would maybe consider HOA documents. So at the purchase of the home, you agree at closing to abide by those documents. And um, the surface impacts, anything that an oil and gas facility would entail would be in violation of pretty much every line item of those HOA documents. And the, the key there is, is that because um, this area was an intact estate, those documents were in place prior to separation of the minerals. So those, in, those then are the prevailing documents. They take precedence. Over, over development of the minerals is if your minerals are severed and leased. No, you can develop your minerals. Okay. No, and we would encourage that. And to be honest, we are working with a company trying to get that done. It's the surface disruption, and it's also then, of course, the fact that this pad site was rec was um, staked and planned for an area in open space that all um, all homeowners in Highland Farms are entitled to use all portion of. And so the person who entered into the agreement, in fact, did not have legal authority to provide that surface. So uh, I think I'm getting there. I'm sorry, it's taken a bit. So essentially there's a belief that there's a way to develop the minerals without intruding on the open space or drilling a well in your- Correct, and I would encourage the development of those minerals. Um, just like on the Pace property, which is also my neighbor, um, I think last time we were here, it might have been insinuated that those minerals were not going to be developed. Windsor neighbors, at all times, we tried to balance for everyone, mineral owners, surface neighbors, the oil company. And I think we were successful in making relationships. And in fact, it was important to us that it's not the Pace family, we all maybe know that name, that the Pace family did in fact get their minerals developed and they will. 
And just like in Highland Farms, I would encourage the development of these minerals, but we have a um, we have we have to protect those HOA documents. Um, and if we don't, as we all know in Colorado, we have our our state has many HOAs and if we were to um, have those break down, I can't imagine what would happen in HOAs. You'd be entitled, it just, they would be, they would have no meaning. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Berry. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Doug Saxton, and I live in Battlement Mesa. And I'm here to tell you why comprehensive development plans should be required for appropriate locations of large-scale gas and oil facilities. I'm concerned that this rulemaking may not offer relief to communities impacted by residential drilling. In Battlement Mesa, nearly 500 residents have petitioned Garfield County to deny permit applications because of location. Many of those concerned are retirees. Proximity itself presents real issues in terms of existing health problems, nuisance and quality of life issues. But the scale, scope and duration of gas development that we are facing are reasons the context created by multiple permits reviewed individually, serially, and as if there has been or will not be any other activity near proposed sites is in, uh, improper. Uh, Ursa Operating Company has drilled just outside our boundaries for three years. They've developed four well pads and drilled 83 wells. And I call your attention to the cluster in red. These are outside, just outside the boundaries of our PUD. One pad is only 500 feet from the nearest home. That's the one on the left. Three other pads bordering us have been permitted and another 80 wells are planned there. The second stage in the drilling out of Battlement Mesa is now in the permitting process with Garfield County. Next one. Here is the downhole map for one of the two pads proposed, both of them inside our borders, both within 1,000 feet of homes in the same subdivision. 53 wells are proposed that will take another three years to put into production. A third stage of development, Ursa envisions two or three more pads just inside our, inside our boundaries and around our uh, golf course and another 41 wells. There's no reason not to suppose that this will take yet another three years. Based on current figures from your website, the average number of wells on a pad for these three stages would be about 22. Additionally, Ursa has told us that when done in the Wasatch Formation, they plan to return to an existing pad and drill two or three deep Niobrara wells, in effect, a fourth phase. Altogether, this will amount to at least a dozen years of drilling with production activity continuing another 20 or 30 years. In the meantime, gathering lines will nearly encircle us and there will be at least three injection wells. So that gives you a picture of the scope, scale, and duration of the development. Now consider impacts. We can't predict health impacts, but just think of the elderly who are particularly vulnerable. Many carry oxygen. Some, like my wife, have asthmatic conditions. How would emissions impact them? Based on averages calculated from your website, my town will have seen 64 water tanks, 23 condensate tanks, and 197 separators in addition to the rigs. Since drilling began, residents have persistently complained about nuisances of odor and noise in addition to traffic. Obnoxious odors and sleep depriving noise from pads have been experienced repeatedly from distances over 2,000 feet. From the start of Ursa's Battlement Mesa project until its end, subdivisions will be impacted over and over again. For instance, if the nuisance impacts continue from these same distances we've experienced, 
One subdivision will have been impacted by three different pads, two subdivisions by four pads, and two other subdivisions will have been in range from five different well pads. Impacts like these can be anticipated with a comprehensive development plan. Drilling by multiple operators around a community as in Battle Mesa is not unique in Colorado. And according to the comments of some operators here, it will soon be much less rare and shared plans could result in shared operations. The reach of wells means a lot to residents. Being able to drill horizontally two and a half miles is great technology to boast about, but using the technology, regardless of expense, to stay as far away as possible from homes ought to be required. We know that CDPs were discussed here as long ago as 2008, but not mandated. It's time for you to require it. Please ensure that siting decisions are made in the context of all operator plans. Consider the implications for cumulative surface impacts on residents. CDPs can be used to facilitate dialogue about impacts and mitigations, but more importantly, identify alternative locations that could make mitigations unnecessary. Please use the siting tools that are available in conjunction with these CDPs to avoid impacts in all Colorado communities where residential drilling is planned. The public has no choice but to trust that you and state rules won't allow our neighborhoods to become industrial zones where it can be prevented. Don't allow the quality of life in our homes that sustain us to become collateral damage of development. And if a hearing results from a decision to approve applications by URSA to drill in battlement, we hope that you will hold the hearing in battlement in order to both see and hear the context of the decision. Thank you for your time today. Are there any questions we can answer? Any questions? Thank you very much. Well, directors and commissioners. Thank you. My name is Carl Erickson. I'm from Welder and Water. Uh, and I've got a very short uh, cautionary tale about uh, alternate site location analysis. Uh, first of all, here we go. Uh, I want to talk about the Midtown Directional Site. Uh, the Midtown Directional Site was originally sited inside Greeley. Uh, in a residential uh, mixed-use area uh, close to high-density uh, housing areas, uh, both owned by UNC and uh, private ownership. And uh, through it, it went through the 2A process, was given a, uh, a uh, site certificate, uh, went through the city planning process. Uh, city planning gave it uh, preliminary approval. It was appealed to the city council of Greeley uh, for use by special review. Uh, and it was only at that stage that enough pressure could be brought both at the city council level and at the commission level. We had meetings with uh, Director Laporte uh, on this site. Uh, we really had to exercise a lot of pressure to get the, uh, the operator to consider relocating that site. And it, it went right up to the city council meeting uh, right before the operator was going to make their case to have the use by special review uh, passed by the city council, uh, they withdrew it and said, we can find another location, okay? Uh, they found two locations, as a matter of fact, one behind uh, Laprino Foods over here and the other one Greeley Directional 
uh, down here. This was the original site right here. Uh, they still were able to access the minerals, okay? Uh, the reason this is a cautionary tale is because it brings us to the Triple Creek site. Now, the Triple Creek site is in itself an alternate location. Originally, it was Sheep Draw, which would have been over here uh, behind uh, King Supers, okay? Uh, enough pressure was brought by community groups to, you know, get the opportunity.